Uh, actually, what I'm going to do in the few minutes that I have, and please uh, shout if I go beyond uh, the, the, my time, is just to, to go back actually to some intuitions that I got when I was doing some research in Lebanon in two, uh, by the end of 2014, beginning at 2015. I was doing research actually on the evolving needs assessment techniques that international organization had to assess the needs for assistance and protection for Syrian refugees in the Beka Valley and in the north of Lebanon. And I was also looking at uh, the, the shift from in-kind to cash-based assistance. And as an economist, I was shocked somehow by the fact that what I could see, and especially the perceptions of the crisis, uh, as I could uh, understand it from the host communities, was completely different from anything I had heard while doing my master degree in economics 20 years before, and getting into the world of what Neil actually uh, told us, the world of what are the main economic models and economic theories on migration. And this gap between um, theories and, and uh, perceptions and reality in Lebanon intrigued me and pushed me to try to put together a few ideas that I will share with you now. But let me say that this is work in progress, so this is why I have my PowerPoint. But it's also because it's not yet, uh, I, I'm very much looking forward to exchanges, inputs and discussions. And I have to say that I'm not an expert of migration and I recognize in the room a few experts of migration, so I feel a bit humbled. And again, look forward to, to your inputs. So let's say the, the red thread or the logic of my presentation is to say that there is a gap between the reality of the Syrian refugee crisis in Lebanon and uh, some of the mainstream uh, theories on migration. And I see that there is a similar gap between mainstream policy discourses as we heard it for, in New York at the General Assembly last week and how basically uh, voters uh, in uh, host countries understand, uh, perceive the crisis and react accordingly. And I think this is a very interesting uh, kind of parallelism in, in gaps uh, and discrepancies. And my main conclusion is that uh, through looking at costs and benefits, we can also understand that if the theory tells us that migration like trade is not a zero sum game, then there is ample room actually to tax benefits and have much more generous redistributive policies in order to compensate for losses and for adaptation. So let's start with uh, Lebanon. I don't know if it's an archetypical forced migration crisis, but it's kind of an extreme one. I just give you to start with a few uh, elements that you certainly know, but in less than two years, you had about 1.2 million Syrian refugees uh, entering Lebanon, uh, accounting for arguably more than 25% of the total population. And uh, actually, Lebanon maintained an open border policy for uh, at least two and a half, three years. It's changed by the end of 2014. They maintained a no camps policy, which means that uh, the refugees were directly living within host communities, especially in urban and semi-urban areas. And uh, just to give you one example, it had as a result a huge hike in rental prices, especially in the poorer quarter, where within uh, a year and a half or so, you had an increase by 44% of average rents. So I was looking at uh, this yearly vulnerability assessments that have been done for Syrian refugees, so-called VAZIR, uh, Vulnerability As Assessment of uh, Syrian Refugees, 2014, 2013, 2014. In 2013, what was interesting is that out of the sample, uh, they found out that the majority of refugees said our primary source of livelihood is the ability to work and you know, the over, uh, overwhelming majority in the informal sector. So uh, wages, actually, well, income in the informal sector was the major source of livelihood, followed then by remittances and receiving aid. Next, the, the year that followed, uh, the picture changed a bit uh, in the assessment done uh, for 2014. One of the major 
constraint for refugees was security and mobility, mainly because of uh, violent reactions uh, and resentment from host communities who were extremely generous, generous in 2011, 2012, partly 2014, but as the crisis became protracted, then uh, the situation changed and uh, some refugees reported not being able to move to bring their children to school or to go to work because of uh, mobility constraints. And this, I think, is important. We are in a context with a largely dysfunctional sectarian state uh, and where public service, if we can call it public service, but essential service delivery is, uh, is uh, weak and uh, actually uh, uh, raises a lot of issue, which I will come back later on when we are thinking on how to envisage redistributive policies, how to envisage social protection, both for host, uh, the host communities and the refugees in a protracted Situ uh, protected crisis situation. So thanks to, to Neil, before I won't spend much time on uh, the economic migration theories, as he very well said, uh, the basic theories, which are quite old by now, uh, focus mainly on pull and push factors. But the main issue here is that migrants are supposed to behave rationally, to make cost-benefit analysis, look at uh, net outcome, and uh, then decide uh, about migrator, migratory patterns based on this cost-benefit analysis. At the macro level, the interesting thing for me is that the focus is, was, uh, to start with, mainly on wage differentials between different labor markets and also labor market regulation. What uh, the new economics of migration, especially since the 1980s, brought to the fore is to look also a bit more at structural fa factors, at markets, and to consider household as a unit of, uh, of production and consumption, and to see what kind of strategies and portfolio of risk management households take, including migratory patterns of some of the members of the uh, of the uh, household members. And for those of you who know, for instance, Somalia and Somaliland, this is clearly a strategy that has been very much uh, present in the strategies of uh, uh, household, uh, Somali households, in terms of how to get access to a range of income options and uh, a portfolio of risk, uh, managing risks that would actually reduce vulnerability. So I won't go into that, but uh, so mainstream economic uh, models show that migration is a win-win. And the question is, is it really? And if so, for whom? Indeed, migration is seen as an engine of poverty alleviation, growth and development. And I think this is very much also the discourse that we heard last week at the, at the UN General Assembly and that gaps in earnings of production factors, mainly labor, relates to marginal factor productivity differentials, wage differentials, but also including uh, technological aspects, uh, uh, technology and, and physical capital associated with uh, the productivity of workers. So basically, migration improves the efficiency worldwide of factor use. And the disconnect between this literature on, forced mig uh, on migration and forced migration, uh, and, and actually the literature, the gray literature that I have seen, for instance, in Lebanon to try to grasp the impact of the Syrian crisis on the Lebanese economy, is that the focus of the gray literature and some of the academic literature as well is on needs, costs, and the impact of aid on vulnerability and uh, livelihood of refugees. And I looked a bit at the literature looking at the situation in Pakistan or Kenya with uh, also protracted refugee, hosting refugee situations. And the literature has those same bias on costs. 
The assumption is that uh, there is a negative impact of uh, massive influx of refugees, migrants in those uh, countries on the labor market with uh, drops on uh, uh, the remuneration for unskilled or low skilled labor. That there is a negative impact in terms of price hikes on essential goods and services that there is a pressure on uh, public services with a deterioration of access to public services for host population, and that there is uh, also pressure on the environment with environmental degradation and so forth. Yet, the question that I never found in the literature is actually who is benefiting from all these changes? Higher, price, uh, higher rental prices obviously is a boon for those uh, owning property and houses and renting apartments or land for uh, informal tented settlements. Lower labor costs is a boon for employers who can then reduce labor costs uh, to produce and market uh, goods and services. And I think there is a, a lack of focus on those aspects. And you may know, uh, especially the uh, migration experts and, and refugee experts uh, among yourselves more about that. But I just found a, a few studies, like a study on, on the Dadaab refugee camp, which look at the situation for 2010. And that found out that actually the uh, income brought to the region where the Dadaab refugee camp is located on the, the coast of, uh, of Kenya, close to Somalia, would amount to an increase of 25% of the provincial <laughs> GDP, and uh, that there are more uh, evidence also of uh, an increase in uh, jobs related to the Dada refugee camp for, uh, in, on the, for the local uh, job market, about 1,200 uh, uh, in the case uh, of Dada for 2010. So for the case of Lebanon, uh, indeed when we hear that uh, most of the, uh, at least uh, in the Vazir 2013, the majority of uh, refugees have uh, income from uh, the, draw income from the informal labor market. This means that indeed this, is, uh, this has a huge impact on wages, uh, in the wages uh, because of this increase in labor supply. And the daily remuneration for construction workers, for petty traders, for agricultural workers uh, was cut by more than half. Just to give you one example, daily remuneration for agricultural workers in the Beka Valley uh, has been cut in, uh, between 2012 and 2014 from $15 a day to $6 a day. But there has been ample evidence and reporting also of uh, <laughs> A deterioration for domestic workers, uh, female in particular, who are doing in average 40% uh, less income than, than, than men, and uh, deterioration also in the situation of Lebanese sex workers. So you can see that uh, th this has a wide-ranging impact indeed, with, as a result, a high level of resentment among the youth, unemployed, and poor Lebanese within host communities. So the result has been actually a big pressure on the government of Lebanon, first to close the border, second to prevent workers, uh, to prevent Syrian refugees from accessing the, the, the labor market, from opening shops and so forth, with an entering frustration from breadwinners in uh, ref Syrian refugee uh, families, with regards to the fact that uh, the result was higher dependency on foreign aid and a shrinking foreign aid. So again, a few studies on the benefits, many on the costs. The World Bank did a big study on the overall impact of the crisis on the Lebanese economy, saying this costs Lebanon at least 2 or 3% of GDP every year. And actually, no analysis of the impact of increasing demand knowing that refugees may have brought just during the first year uh, about uh, over $100 million uh, in cash, and that cash and food voucher program injected uh, over $800 million 
in the economy in 2013-14. And uh, with this system, there is more than 400 shops that are involved in the food voucher program. There are banks, uh, Lebanese banks involved in the cash distribution, etc. So for me as an economist, it's clear that there are much greater profit margins in the sector where wages fell by 50%, and that landowner and house uh, owners benefited from higher rents, basically higher return for capital, lower return on low-skill labor. So migration can be seen not as a win-win, but as a win-lose, at least in the short run. And if we look at distributional impact, and for that reason, uh, immigrants uh, serve as scapegoat to blame for unemployment or low wages, insecurity, and so forth. Yes, the host country benefits from an influx of resources, of <coughs> skills, of foreign aid. And uh, the issue here for me is that uh, looking at the benefits of such an influx, the question is how can we actually tax those benefits, complement as need be uh, the, 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 those, ta those tax that the host state is able to, to draw with foreign aid, and then make sure that this is uh, uh, put into good use to compensate losers and to uh, also uh, pay for adaptation And I would argue that it's just like a uh, freer trade. We know that free trade creates winners and losers. I think that the, the supporters of Donald Trump in Michigan and elsewhere have very well understood what is the impact of freer trade with China uh, for them. And uh, their reaction is quite clear. The question is again that the losers are not compensated whatsoever and uh, there is not enough effort being put into funding, education, vocational training and the rest of it in order for uh, low-skilled labor to adapt and uh, come back to, uh, let's say, uh, get, get greater skills for adaptation. So my... Uh, Conclusion is that if the overall macro impact is not a zero-sum game for trade as for migration, as we hear uh, again and again, then we can posit that we can simply tax part of the gains to compensate for the losses. And then I was thinking, how can we do that in Lebanon? And I must say that uh, it's, it's a huge challenge because of the sectarian nature of the provision of social protection and, uh, uh, and assistance. And it's also a challenge because uh, maybe the most functional arm of the Lebanese state is designated as a terrorist organization. And as long as we have, and especially major donors, have counterterrorism measures which prevent to engage with the Lebanese state and especially with Hezbollah, not to name it, uh, then we have, a, we have a huge problem in trying to figure out how to set up a system which is redistributive, not in the sense of patronage politics, but which is redistributive in the sense of compensating for losses. So option for Lebanon, and this is work in progress, better document the cost, but also the benefits on the host state and communities focus simultaneously on the livelihood of Syrian and Lebanese vulnerable people and design and phase out the cash assistance program for Syrian consistent with social protection system for the Lebanese poor and uh, increase taxation and aid in order to, uh, to um, have uh, stronger and more resources for compensation. A question which is open, which we can discuss, is uh, to what extent should uh, Lebanon introduce much stricter labor regulation to try to reduce options on the informal market and to enforce labor laws and regulations? There are pros and cons. It's a very important topic. And then uh, to improve the channels for remittances that should be safer and cheaper. Okay, so as I say, it's work in progress, and I really look forward to uh, the discussion with you and to get also feedbacks on, that, uh, on these reflections. Thank you.